Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Mary Renoff. As a reminder, the information provided during this event is for information purposes only. If you have any questions around COVID-19 pandemic, please visit our website at providence.org or visit cdc.org for official medical updates. This event does not create a doctor-patient relationship and any questions or medical advice discussed is not considered guidance for what you should do. For any medical questions, please reach out to your primary care or healthcare professional. So let's begin by welcoming our guest, Darren Godden, Chief of Staff at Orange County City of Hope and my former Prov uh, Providence fellow caregiver or employee. Darren, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you, Mary. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, Darren, I think many people want to hear your story because not only are you a COVID survivor, blessings, <laughs> um, you had no previous uh, chronic conditions or underlying health conditions. You're young, you're healthy, you're fit. So you you were very surprised to get this diagnosis, I would assume. So can yeah. you start by just sharing your journey with us? Yeah, just the short of it is, um, you know, the weekend before I was hospitalized, which was on a Tuesday, um, began to get a high fever um, that started Saturday morning. Um, previously to that, Thursday night had a headache, um, took some over-the-counter cold medicine and um, thought I would just sleep it off. The next morning, took a shower, got out of the shower, had a little dizzy spell, thought it might be related to the cold medicine, felt fine, went to work, um, was fine all day, was fine that night actually. Um, woke up Saturday morning with uh, 103 fever, um, started treating that with some ibuprofen and that sort of thing, drinking lots of fluids, and it just continued all weekend long. And so by Monday, I um, had developed a cough as well and um, told my wife, I was like, do you think this could be coronavirus? And we kind of laughed at it, laughed at it a little bit and thought that, you know, it could be, but maybe not. Um, I called my, um, did a virtual visit with a doctor through my insurance company on Sunday night. It took seven hours to get a call back on that. And they said, it sounds like the flu, just drink lots of fluids, rest, that sort of thing. Um, prescribed me some Tamiflu. Um, by Monday, I was feeling worse. And Tuesday, I decided to go looking for a testing facility that I'd heard was somewhere near St. Joseph Hospital of Orange. Um, but I decided uh, at the last minute to go ahead and call Providence Express Care as well, thinking that if I found the facility to get a test, they might want a doctor's order. So I called them and it was then when I found out that uh, they thought I should go to the emergency room. So that's how I ended up at the, the ER at St. Joseph Orange. Wow, it's so amazing. I think a lot of people in the early phases were told it was the flu. I, mm -hmm. I was told it was the flu and I said, oh, I had a flu shot, I don't know. I don't feel quite like it's the flu. Um, you did a virtual visit and then you went to an emergency room and you chose a Providence facility, which we're yeah. so glad, right? <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about that experience. Why did you choose virtual? Yeah, so I'd already, like I said, it took seven hours for the other, the other one through my insurance company. And so um, what I thought was, Express Care knows the geography. I know they're local. Um, they'll probably know if there is a testing facility at St. Joe Orange, which is my hospital of choice anyways. Um, and so when I called, um, I was really grateful that the provider that I was connected with um, went through all the symptoms and she consulted with somebody, came back on the line and said, uh, you need to go to the ER right now. And she said, "Are you how, how close are you to the nearest hospital? I said, I'm near St. Joe Orange. I'm about 10 minutes away. Um, I was, I pulled off the freeway to take the, take the call or, you know, connected via video on my app. And, um, she said, go right away. And I said, well, I was really just hoping to get a test. Cause I figure, you know, I've seen it on TV. If I'm positive, I'll just go home and um, isolate and do that sort of thing. And she said, no, based on your symptoms that you're telling me, she said, we think you should go to the ER. So she called them to let them know I was on my way. And when I arrived, they were ready for me. There was a nurse out there already. And, um, uh, the valet guy badged me into the parking lot, said, park your own car. Uh, I parked my own car, walked up to the nurse. They took my temperature, put a mask on me. And all within about an hour time frame, I was already having a chest x-ray. And the chest x-ray came back with the information that the doctor said he was pretty certain would be coronavirus based on the, the pattern that was in the lungs. And so I had bilateral pneumonia. Um, and then he said they would test that or confirm that with a uh, nasal swab. And that came back two days later that I was indeed positive. So um, yeah, I, I, chose, I chose the virtual visit because I felt like they were close, they knew the area, they knew the hospital, um, and I trusted them. So um, have used it before and um, it was very helpful. Yeah, I'm a big virtual fan when I don't wanna expose other people to my symptoms. So obviously a good choice on your part. 
I think, you know, a lot of people know that Providence had the first coronavirus case in the mm -hmm. U.S., but people may not know you were actually the first coronavirus case in, in, our, Saint, or in our Orange County, St. Joseph area. Yeah. Yeah. So at St. Joseph Hospital, I was their first patient. I didn't know that until after I was mm -hmm. ventilated and off the ventilator is when I actually found that out. But um, they had been preparing and they just like, you know, the rest of the health system had been getting ready for this and doing all the training and so forth. So, um, yeah, I was there first when I arrived. It, it was actually pretty scary, Mary, um, because the the nurse that came out was wearing like a full on space suit. Um, mm -hmm. We're similarly aged. So remember the movie E.T.? It felt like that scene oh, yeah. from E.T. <laughs> um, the tent was set up outside. They came out with a full PPE, the protect, protective equipment, um, the, the mask over the head, everything. And I was like, Whoa, this is this is pretty serious. And then when they took me into the ER, they took me through a side door straight into an exam room. I didn't see anybody else. And then everybody that came in um, to to uh, treat me or work with me um, were all wearing the same thing. And so I actually was pretty scared of myself once I was seeing all that um, because it became real to me that this is not just your everyday flu or cold. This is something that's highly contagious. And if I have it, that's going to be pretty scary. So um, yeah. Well, what's interesting is you had spent years, right, in our own system telling about how great the care is and the wonderful workers, yeah. but you probably hadn't really experienced a lot of it firsthand. But I know right. you wrote a four-part, I think, series in Facebook, which I can't even reread because I cried through the entire <laughs> thing and I tried to reread it to my father and I cried the whole time. Um, but talk a little bit about the care you received because I know you've been very vocal about that. Yeah, I have been. And, and the reason why I chose to write about it was... Um, well, first of all, it was very therapeutic for me. Um, when I was released from the hospital, um, you know, I've been out now, gosh, almost five weeks, I guess. And the recovery has been pretty slow. We could talk about that in a little while, but um, I felt like I needed to start talking about it. Um, I had already been talking to my wife and every time she and I would talk about it, we would just cry. Um, but I felt like I needed to write about it. I, I've been in communication for a long time. And so the, the thing I knew to do was to start putting words to paper and, and, telling the story as well as working through and processing some of the, the feelings and emotions and stuff I was going through. So, um, yeah, so I started doing that and, um, it really helped me because I was also kind of feeling a little bit, um, like I would say probably a little sense of depression, even though I was extremely grateful for being alive and realizing how close I came to not making it. Um, I was so happy and I was happy to be home with my family and my kids and my wife. Um, but yet there was like this weight on me and it was the best thing I can describe it is, is depression. I've not really dealt with that a lot of my life. And so, um, writing about it seemed to be really helpful. And, um, as I began to express it, um, it was super long. And so I thought I'll do this in multiple parts and people started leaving their comments and, um, you know, that was really helpful. I, I was expressing the care I received from St. Joe Orange, from the, the entire care team, from the doctors, to the nurses, the respiratory therapist, the lab folks. I mean, everybody that was um, working my case was just awesome and wonderful. Um, but then I began to hear from them as well as I started to tell the story. And that was extremely helpful as well. Well, you had an amazing care team and you had an amazing family support network, but I think people may not know you had a huge prayer network. You had a Facebook group of people praying for you. I know I had the Sisters of Providence and the Sisters of St. Joseph praying for you. We were all praying for you. Talk a little bit to me about kind of the spiritual nature of, of what this pandemic has done for people. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go from my own perspective and from my wife's perspective. Um, once I was in the ER and the doctor said he thought I had COVID, he was pretty sure um, and that they would be admitting me. Um, I called my wife and I was crying because it was so real at the time and it was so scary. Um, and, you know, she thought she's a nurse, but she's not practicing right now. So she said, you know, they're probably going to hydrate you, give you some IV fluids, that sort of thing. She's like, you'll probably be home in a couple of days. You'll be fine. And so um, while she said that it was reassuring, but at the same time, it's still very scary. And so I don't actually remember a whole much, a whole bunch of that first week um, because I did continue to get sicker and sicker and breathing became an, uh, even harder and they kept increasing my oxygen and that sort of thing and trying different masks on me and to see if I could get more oxygen and that sort of thing. Um, so that was a Tuesday and by Saturday I was put on a ventilator. I was intubated and on the ventilator then for um, nine days. So um, 
Yeah, I, I don't remember a whole lot from that first week, but I remember being very scared. Um, I called another friend of mine as well, and I remember him being very encouraging from the ERs, just saying, you're going to make it through this. You're going to be fine. We're going to pray. Um, on that Saturday morning was the worst for me. Um, I called my wife. I told her that I could barely breathe. Um, I also called my friend, and I told him. He, again, encouraged me. And I guess after that call, um, he felt so strongly that he called my wife and he said, we're going to start asking people to pray. So he got all these people to record videos for me and he was sending them to my phone. But at that point, I was already like I wasn't even touching the phone. All I was doing was focusing on trying to get breath because I really didn't want to be innovated. Um, but he he reached out to a bunch of folks that spread like wildfire. Um, and, you know, it got to you as well and to Morgan and others on the team. And so when I was finally off the ventilator, uh, it, it literally ended up being thousands of people from all over the world, all across the country, churches in other parts of the world, people that I don't even know if they go to church or not, but were sending me messages. The sisters themselves sent me uh, just incredible cards. I got home, I had at least 20 cards from the sisters of um, St. Joseph, um, just letting them know that they were thinking about me, praying for me and giving me encouragement. Um, it was really moving. Um, in addition to that, the caregivers themselves at the hospital, um, I had so many people say, can I pray for you? And I was like, yes, you may. Yeah. Um, and so, and I've heard stories since then of even while I was on the ventilator, um, nurses and um, respiratory therapists and stuff, just encouraging me and praying for me. And um, it's incredible to know that they weren't just taking care of my sickness. Uh, they weren't just taking care of my body. Um, but they were looking after me as um, truly what we call that whole person care. And they were looking after my spirit as well. And, and the best way they knew to do that when I was in a coma was to, to pray and ask God to intervene. And um, I'm certainly so glad that he did. And I'm thankful for everybody who um, was standing in faith for me, as well as fighting for me when I felt like, obviously, I couldn't fight for myself. And my wife also, um, from her perspective, she was very... Um, optimistic at first, um, very sad when she heard that I was innovated. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk to each other before they innovated me. Um, and so that was for her uh, a scary moment. Um, and then the rest of the week as she would get the updates over those eight nights, nine days, um, things got worse. And, and they started talking to her about if he doesn't improve by tomorrow, um, we may need to move him to a different hospital so he can go on an ECMO machine, which is not only would breathing be done for me outside my body, but also my heart would be, that function would also be taken over by a machine. Um, and my wife just really felt after working with the care team and understanding from their perspective, how much they were working for me as their first official uh, COVID positive case, um, that she just felt like that wouldn't be a good idea if they had to transfer me. She thought that would be um, not good for the team either, that they really needed this victory and they needed this win. And so she just started to pray that that uh, that wouldn't happen and that I would begin to recover there at St. Joe Orange and that I would come off the ventilator there and I would walk out um, of the hospital there at St. Joe Orange. And um, pretty much all of that happened except for the walking out part. I was had, I had to be wheeled out, but um, <laughs> uh, still, um, yeah, just so thankful for all the people who were who were um, standing in faith for me, including yourself, Mary. So thank um, you. I'm going to get through this without crying. I made that <laughs> promise to everybody. But I, I still have people texting me and sending me messages saying, how's your friend Darren? And they're still praying for you. And it was my bad not to continue to give a lot of updates, but strangers. And and you know me, right? I work in the influencer field. You had NFL players praying for you. You had MLB Bye. players. I mean, there was a big group of people. But I, you know, you just mentioned your wife kind of, of being a little bit of your advocate while you couldn't talk. And I think one of the things about your story that touched me so much was that she kind of went to bat for you and said, let's flip him. Let's test yeah. this because we're all learning, right? Nobody knows yeah. how to deal with COVID. We're all learning. She had done the research, talked to other groups and your care team was happy to listen to her and make that choice. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how she did that? Yeah. So she has a friend um, that she went to nursing school with who is an ICU nurse in Georgia. And I think they had already had some COVID, COVID patients. And um, she had been treating patients with ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, I think is what it's called, which is eventually what I had. Um, and many folks were treating it like just the respiratory um, uh, disease. And we've since learned in the weeks and, you know, the last month or so, it's much more than that. And it impacts different people different ways. And we're continuing to learn that. 
Um, so her friend said, you know, based upon all the numbers, my wife's never worked in an ICU, so she didn't get all the like pressure numbers and all that stuff, but she takes copious notes. She was uh, sharing those with her friend and her friend said, gosh, if, if these numbers don't change, um, over the next couple of days, you should really inquire with this care team about proning him, which is turning him from his back onto his stomach. Um, so Katie did that. And, um, I, I wrote that it was dismissed. It wasn't really dismissed. It was the reasons around it were fair. Um, it takes a lot of people to turn a guy over when he's 200 pounds. Um, I'll go with 200. It was a little more than that. Um, turn him over. And then also all of the, the, the tubes and all that other stuff have to be considered. Um, as well as it's also highly possible that you will expose more people, um, to the virus at that time. And so, um, for St. Joe Orange at first, you know, um, from what I understand that the, the doctors were, um, thinking that they were optimistic that in my current position, I would, I would do just fine. Um, but as I said, things did get worse and the, the care team did make the decision to do that. And I understand, um, the way they did that was, uh, the day shift stayed a little bit late. The, the night shift had arrived, um, with a nurse manager as well. They had the crew to do it and they flipped me. Um, and that, that was, um, what began to make a difference for me. I began to improve after that. And then they continued to do that for the rest of the time while I was on the ventilator. Um, I wish one of them could be here to like talk about those things too. Cause I've had doctors call me and they tell me things that were going on. And, um, it's just incredible to hear from the other perspective as well of what they were thinking and what they were feeling, that sort of thing. But yeah, I, I do feel like Katie advocated for me on that. And, um, but the doctors themselves as well, they would continually tell Katie that, um, um, that they were always looking at the, the research. They were looking at new articles that were coming out. They were, they were finding out what other people were doing and other things that were happening and how they could best, um, um, care for me. My, my current employer, um, city of hope, orange County, um, you know, even doctors from city of hope consulted on my case and gave, um, some, some suggestions and so forth. And so they tried different drugs on me as well. And I'm just so grateful like I said, the, in the, the way I wrote about it, that there was an army out there fighting for me. It wasn't just the people praying. It wasn't just the nurses working in the room or the doctors making the decisions. It was truly a care team that they were getting the information from wherever they could get it and threw the kitchen sink at me. And um, by the grace of God, it, it worked. And I came off the ventilator on the ninth day. So. Well, and, and interestingly enough, I've actually been in some of the COVID units across our system and I've seen some of the patients flipped. And what I've really liked about that was watching their care team talk to them, even though most of them were sedated or kind of in a, yep. you know, a medical induced coma, they talked to them, they touched them, they told them what was happening. And I know you talked about that as well. Your nurses were having full on conversations with you, even though you may not remember them. What, what did it mean to you to hear that later? You know, it was incredible. So I, I told the story uh, as I wrote about my story, it's because I, I only knew what I knew at the time. Um, uh, a respiratory therapist named Tyler came in my room after I was um, off the, the ventilator and he had been off for a few days and he came in and I was already asleep, but he knocked and said, may I come in? And he came in um, and he introduced himself and he just said how happy he was that I was alive and he had worked on me while I was on the ventilator. Um, still the medicines were still clearing my head. So I didn't quite, I didn't quite have a full understanding of everything that meant. Um, but he said he would talk to me. The nurses would talk to me. Um, I've since heard the story of the, the first few nights I had this nurse named Sydney and now I'm going to cry. So I'm going to try not to do that. Um, you know, she wrote me and then as I read what she wrote and talked to my wife, my wife said, oh my gosh, she would call me from the night shift, you know, which normally the day, the day folks would call or the doctor would call, but she called and she said, what kind of music does he like? And my wife said, you know, he he's really likes country. She's like, I knew I would like him. Um, uh, and she said, you know, he's also, you know, he likes uh, worship music and stuff. So she's like, all right. Um, so asked about my family, those sort of things. And um, I understand that she stayed in my room for like nine hours that night. And she just talked to me um, and she would just talk to me about my kids and tell me to fight, that sort of thing. She'd play the music for me. Um, Mary, I can't tell you how much that means to me to know that, I mean, I'm sedated. I'm on paralytic medication. I don't remember any of that. Um, she put herself at risk, you know, I mean, nine hours in that room. Um, and again, I don't know how, if that's normal for the ICU or not, but it doesn't feel normal when there's this virus that, she could be infected with. Um, and so to know that somebody was there talking me through it and encouraging me um, for those entire nine days, I, she wasn't the only one, other nurses and respiratory therapists did the same. 
And um, I'm just so grateful for that because um, I, I know I was scared when I was innovated. Um, that was one reason that my wife was just feeling so downcast about it was because she wanted me to go, if I needed to be innovated, she wanted me to be, be in that place of um, just standing strong and firm. And she didn't feel like I was in that place when I had to be innovated. And so I'm just so thankful that people did that for me, you know, and, and fought for me. And, well, and especially because, you know, when you're in that situation, your wife wants to be with you and holding your hand and touching you. And in this situation, our families can't be there. And so I think the nurses are stepping up and they're playing not just care caregiver and care provider, but really family support. They are. They are. And it's um, it's it's not lost on me that we're doing this today and Nurses Week begins soon and we're yeah. celebrating them. And um, certainly the doctors, nurses, frontline caregivers and many other essential workers have been getting a lot of attention and praise during this, but um, I, I'm just thankful that it's this week during Nurses Week because yeah. um, uh, you know I've had many of my doctors call me, I've had many of the nurses reach out, and I um, I just want to give honor where honor is due. Um, they are the ones who God empowers to do the work that they do, and um, I'm I'm aware of that, and I, I truly believe that while all these people were praying and and standing in faith for me. Um, I believe that that care team was being empowered supernaturally to do the best thing that they could do for me and make sure that I lived and came home to my little boys and my wife. And um, they, they were, they were more than just caregivers. They were, um, they were being that family. Um, I know that there's a, a, a drive going on now from a doctor at um, Children's Hospital of Orange County. I, you may have seen him. He's the dancing doctor. Yeah. <laughs> He's been doing this drive to get um, iPads or I, old mm -hmm. iPhones or this sort of thing for St. Joe Orange so that um, patients can have that live connection via video with their family. And I just think that's incredible because um, that's such a missing thing right now for COVID patients. They, you're isolated, you're alone. And even though you can talk on the phone or whatever, that video link I think is important, so. The face, just seeing the face, it matters so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I believe all of our doctors, nurses, but even people like you and I, I believe that you're called to work at this mission. I think yeah. we all are. I mean, I came from sports and entertainment into healthcare, which was confusing for many people, but when you're called, you're called. So, yeah. So, Darren, I mean, we talked about the fact that you didn't have any underlying conditions. You're a fairly healthy dude. Like, talk to me about the recovery because we've been hearing that the recovery yeah. is really rough. I mean, some people can't even stand up on their own for a while. How, how is yeah. it going for you? So the recovery is very slow. Um, I am about five weeks out right now. I plan to go back to work next week. So I've been off this whole time. Um, the doctors say for every day you're on the ventilator, and I would probably add some of those days when you're just laying in the hospital bed, you need to plan for a week of recovery. Um, the first day, it was probably a couple days after coming off the ventilator. I, I actually came off the ventilator on a Sunday and I went home on a Wednesday. Um, I pushed that with my doctors. Actually, I just really wanted to be with my family. Um, I wasn't having any other symptoms. All my blood work was coming back normal. My um, chest X-ray was coming back good. So they agreed that if physical therapy um, did the assessment and they agreed that I could go home that day. Um, physical therapy came in. Um, they had me stand with a walker and I had to use every ounce of my ability to will myself into being able to demonstrate that I could move with a walker. It was very difficult. For the first 10 days I got home, I had to walk with a walker. I was very unsteady on my feet, um, pretty much had no strength. I mean, I uh, could not pick up the kids whatsoever. Even picking up a glass of water was difficult. My fine motor skills were severely impacted, um, had a little bit of um, neurological slowness as well from all of the sedation and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, the recovery was really tough. Um, as a communicator, I was having a hard time finding words. I couldn't write like I did. I tried to write and my my writing was impacted. Um, so there was a lot of things like that. So it's been taking a long time. Um, I have been trying to push it to go faster. One of my doctors called me yesterday to check in with me and he said, you know, I told you a week for every day. And he's like, that's still a ways away. And I said, well, I'm, I'm feeling better. I feel about 90 to 95%. So um, yeah, I don't think people realize uh, how much that takes a toll on you. Um, as well as the COVID virus itself seems to have some just crazy effects on different parts of your body, everything from your brain to your lungs, to your heart, other organs. Luckily, I didn't have much um, of that, um, no uh, organ failure, that sort of thing, but um, they're still learning about it. And so, yeah, the recovery has been re very, very slow. Are you using, I know that a lot of the COVID patients are having kind of like at home care and, and support provided and even monitoring. Are you using any of those services? Yeah. So I'm done now, but when I was discharged, they discharged me with home health and it was going to be a remote monitoring um, mm -hmm. through, through St. Joseph home health. I think it was called. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we actually used an app, I think, that has been created by the system called Twistle. And uh -huh. so three times a day, I would check in. They would send me a text and I would check in. Um, they sent me home with a pulse ox, pulse oximeter mm -hmm. to measure my uh, blood oxygen as well as a uh, thermometer to take my own temperature. And then I would report my pulse ox, my pulse, um, my temperature, as well as um, how many breaths I'm taking a minute. And I would answer some other questions about how I'm just generally feeling. Um, and then a home health nurse would call occasionally as well just to check in as well. So um, I did that for about two and a half weeks before I was discharged from that. And I thought that was a pretty good way of, um, of you know, checking in and, and them keeping a, a tab on me without having to go in and be um, exposing to anybody else. And of course, I've had follow-up visits with doctors and virtual visits as well. So, Well, talking about exposing other people, we've got some questions coming in and some of them are, did your family get COVID as well? Yeah, I know we're short on time, but yeah, so Katie, Katie got tested um, once I was uh, in the hospital and confirmed uh, the health department did reach out to her and she got tested and she was positive as well. She had a couple of days of symptoms and um, was feeling fine after that. She didn't have anything else. Um, and um, she did uh, isolate for about four weeks, even though they told her 14 days was what was required. She didn't leave the house at all. Um, my in-laws would come over to help, but they'd stay outside and bring yeah. stuff. We had a, that whole army of people bringing food and everything and supplies and everything, which was great. But um, I, I also should mention, you know, you, um, uh, my, my current employer, um, City of Hope Orange County, the team there, I, I know many of them from previous uh, previous roles and so forth. They were so compassionate, so caring. I mean, they also uh, provided for my family and took care of my wife and kids. And um, I'm just so grateful. You guys were praying. I know people were sending stuff to the nursing staff. Greg Till, the head of HR, sent uh, pizza to the, the ICU team. Um, and I just thought, how awesome is it to be part of a big family? And we're all in healthcare. We're all serving patients in this area. And I just think it's awesome that we can come together and regarding of our brand and come together and say, we're here because this is what we're called to do, like you said, and take care of people. And um, just awesome. Yeah. Well, somebody asked if you have considered donating plasma for research. I actually did that. My birthday was on okay. Saturday. And uh, the Red Cross one, thank you. The Red Cross is the one who is um, acting as kind of the clearinghouse for collecting that uh, convalescent blood plasma. And they called me and scheduled me last week. And um, they scheduled it on Saturday morning, which was my birthday. So um, I thought that was a great way to be able to pay it forward and um, hopefully help someone else in their fight. So, yeah, I did that. It took about an hour and a half. Um, wasn't too painful. It's like kind of giving blood just a little bit longer. And so um, I don't know who that plasma went to, but I am um, believing that it's going to go and help somebody else who's uh, in a bad place right now with COVID. And hopefully it helps them to recover much quicker and maybe keep them from a ventilator, um, which means they'll recover even faster. So uh, okay. yeah, it's a pleasure to do that. This birthday must have been like... I mean, it must have just meant so much to you. I'm not going to cry. I'm really not. But All right. Yeah, it, it really did. I mean, we did a low key celebration, obviously, because everyone's still in quarantine. But uh, yeah, you know, I used to not want to talk about my age. But now I, my, my headline for my birthday was alive at 45, not dead at 44. And I'm happy about that because, um, you know, Mary, as I see the numbers and I see the statistics of the people that are dying, for me, those are not just numbers. Um, those are not just statistics to roll on the side of the screen as the news gives the reports. Um, it's not for political reasons or for economical reasons for me. Um, I look at those numbers and I think every single one of those people who have died, they were just like me, they're just like you. They probably never expected to get as sick as they did. And they have family, they have loved ones, they might have kids or parents or whatever else people that love them and care for them. They have dreams, they have plans for their life and their outcome wasn't like my outcome. And I, it's not lost on me that I, um, I won't use the word lucky cause I don't think it's luck, but, um, I think God is using that and using that story. But, um, I, I think about those folks and those families that are impacted by it. And I'm just so thankful where I ended up, but, um, I pray regularly for those folks and, and for those families because it's, it's not an easy thing and, um, loss is terrible. So. Well, we are so grateful that you've made it through and so grateful for you for sharing your story because I know that it matters. And if nothing else, it does explain to people that it's not just the elderly. It's not just the super sick. There are a lot of people getting sick and this staying home and staying safe and taking precautions. It matters. It really does. So Darren, thanks for joining us today. And thanks for sharing your story. And, and, and 
Yeah. And to everyone for listening and sending in your questions, we appreciate you greatly. Um, we can always be found on Twitter at Providence and under Providence Health System on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, and if you have any questions, you can continue to drop them into our messages here and we will try to get back to you with answers in the next 48 hours. So thank you everyone for listening. We appreciate your time and please stay safe and stay healthy. Bye guys.